and what is your position on NAFTA? Has it changed over the years? Where do you stand on expansion of NAFTA-like agreements to Colombia? Well, I'll tell you, in this region, uh, trade is very important, and, and trade is an important issue. Uh, when NAFTA first came out, I thought that it was a, a pretty good idea, but I knew that there would be repercussions, particularly with people involved in middle-class America. So I did not, I was not in a position, I was a military officer, I looked at it and said, that makes sense, free trade is probably good overall for the economy, but I'm concerned about the repercussions. And as we know, the repercussions are fairly steep. And all you have to do is go through the budget bill to see what's happened to the economy there and realize that it was a misguided policy. Now moving along to the captain, uh, you know, captain was in the news in the last couple of weeks and, and the speaker was able to put it indefinitely off to the side. You know, Columbia is a place of mess. I think you all know that. No matter uh, whether you go back to the drug cartels, whether you talk about the FARC, whether you talk about any of the rebel agencies down there, they're still competing for power. And for us to just openly give free trade to a, a, not only an organization down there, the government that's got interest in the various things going on, I think is, is a concern. And so, although in general I believe in trade, and I believe in free trade, I think that we have to move into overall repercussions, not only to our nation and our economic vitality, but also what happens down in other countries. So in general, I'm pleased that the captain hasn't gone through Let's see what else we can find out about where the money is really going. We really have to really take care of it. Um, with, with the NAFTA agreement, at least my thinking is, I think it, it helps, it does help our area of Virginia because, as we all know that, the Texas Corona area is really the economic engine of Virginia, if not of, of northern Virginia, but possibly the entire state of Virginia. Um, I think the telecommunications market is huge. But, um, but growing up, of course, in a city like Lowell, I, I totally see what happened when the textile industry, of course, stopped running. A lot of people end up going on public assistance because they're not well trained and end up taking service injury uh, jobs, service jobs, which actually don't pay very well. And, um, but you know what, I, I think about some of the problems with this issue because, for example, I always think about Raytheon Company, which you know, back when I grew up, one out of every four people in, living in Massachusetts worked for Raytheon, because Raytheon was a big developing contractor. And the interesting thing about Raytheon is I was an executive secretary when I was 18 years old because I was trained to do what um, women should do, deliver coffee to men. <laughs> Which would look up my skirts when I was 18 years old. It's terrible, huh? But um, actually, that's what I did. I would do a little copy to the engineers, and um, there was not a lot of female engineers. It was really sad, but it was basically men. But you know what was interesting? The reason why some of them were so tough Republicans is because the, my husband, who was the janitor at the time, my first husband, was, was emptying the garbage barrel, but he made $31,000 a year. In 1985, I was making 13,000. The engineers started at 30,000. They had to get their bachelor's degree. But he and his friend, who his friend was a big-time alcoholic, would sleep and snore in the rooms. But they were getting an enormous amount of money—31,000 a year. And the millwrights, they were getting 55,000, so more than the senior electrical engineers. So I, I started thinking about it. Hmm. Why do you think Raytheon went down? So. Because <laughs> I'm so honest, right? Like, um, why do you think Raytheon went down? Does anybody help me with this? Well, you know what? When you start, I mean, it gets expensive paying and being competitive, paying people to empty the barrel of 30,000 a year. So there has to be something there. But of course, it hurt my family when, when uh, the Andover plant closed and the Gulf plant closed. And again, because it was so expensive. so. I do think that what the, what's the reason why the free graded treatment is hurting us because we need to go ahead and be realistic with how much we're going to pay people. I mean, they could have gave them $25,000 a year, you know, I mean, or $20,000 a year. But when you start paying people, um, I have to be careful this time. But, anyways, I do think we need to, we, we do need to fix the system. But again, I do think we need to fix the businesses too. And I think illegal immigration hurts the system. Thank you.
Well, I, I'm the only one rat, running that has a record on that, and I voted against it. And I voted against it because I felt that it didn't have the requisite human rights protections, it didn't have the requisite environmental protections built into it. We took this to the Clinton administration, and I was uh, a delegation of women, actually, who went down to the Maquiadoras in, in Mexico and saw how they were being operated. When the uh, American overseers of these companies would say, we love to hire young women between the ages of 15 and 23 because they're so compliant. Uh, um, you know, you, you knew something was going on. And so it was apparent to me off the bat that, that we can't compete with the likes of China if they're using prison labor. I think America can compete with anybody on an equal playing field. I don't, I don't have any problem at all with our talent and our belief, and I believe in trade. But you've got to give us a chance. If, if we have environmental laws and the other countries don't, then we can't compete with them because we hold ourselves to a different standard. If we have labor protections in this country and the other countries don't, the reason the Columbia trade agreement is a bad one is because there's a systematic policy to go out and kill labor leaders. That's a bad thing. <laughs> that is a bad thing. So until that's addressed, why would you sign on to it? Until that is addressed. So I do believe that we are in a global economy, that we've got to trade, but the people in Mexico who fought so hard for NAFTA have also found out a valuable lesson because their jobs are starting to go away now too. And the lesson they found is somebody is always willing to work cheap. And you can't have a race to the bottom and expect people to be able to put food on their food family's tables and a roof over their family's head. So I think the economy should be one of lifting us all up, not depressing us all down. You know, um, I don't believe in an ideological approach to anything, if you can help it. I believe in a very pragmatic approach to government, because I think ideology often gets in the way. And that's true on the subject of so-called free trade. Uh, for a noble ideal, free, the free movement of goods and services across the planet that can lift everybody's boat, we kind of we overlook the fact that, but that may be the ideal, but that's not the reality. And China is a great example. Um, it isn't a level playing field. It's certainly not a level playing field in terms of the protection of organized men and women who want to work for a living and want to be able to form labor union protection. It's certainly not a level playing field in terms of environmental protection. China, as you know, right now is racing against the clock to try to figure out a way to clean up the environment in Beijing for the Olympics because it's among the most polluted, air polluted cities on the planet. Um, it's certainly not a level playing field in terms of free access of US goods to the Chinese market. We now have the largest trade deficit in the world with China. Ten years ago, it was Japan. So China really caught up and then went beyond Japan. How did that happen? And oh, by the way, well, certainly the goods coming into the United States have been well examined and, and regulated, right? Well, you, you and I both know food goods, children's toys, cosmetics, clothing actually have some serious issues with them because they haven't been well regulated or well inspected either on the Chinese end or on the receiving American end. So if we're going to talk about trade and trade pacts, we have to have a candid conversation about what constitutes level playing field. And frankly, whether it's in Congress or in the White House, we need to protect American interests in the process. And I think that's what's been lacking, uh, frankly, in the discussion about so-called free trade. Now, CAFTA was mentioned just a few minutes ago, the Central American Free Trade Agreement, especially with respect to uh, Colombia. Two days after Speaker Pelosi pulled the fast-track agreement, and correctly so, because what happened was President Bush interrupted negotiations with the Democrats in the House of Representatives and basically called her bluff. 
she called his bluff. But two days after she did that, a slew of people affiliated with the government in Bogota were indicted for plotting murders, including, as Leslie said, murders against organized labor. I'm not sure that's the kind of government we want to be calling a, an equal partner.